regardless of how beautiful Athens is and Greece is, as you might have understood, there are many other social issues. But I've seen Athens in, let's say, 11 or 12. This is a gloomy city. Many streets were kind of dodgy, we had a problem with trust, and since then I've seen lots of change. But things are not like great. Things are bleeding and there's a fever and all that. But also the prices are like really, really high because not Greek people are buying. Athens is more than the neighborhoods that surround the Acropolis. The unwieldy metropolitan area extends from the mountains to the sea, snaking up the coast known as the Athenian Riviera. At first, the suburbs of this eternal city were the result of a rapidly growing middle and upper classes fleeing the chaos of the city center. No more noisy traffic or overcrowded polikatekias. Instead, they had spacious avenues proper urban planning, and sandy beaches. But the behemoth that is Athens did not leave these outskirts untouched for too long. Quickly, areas like Glyfada and Vula became consumed by the city. The mega-project of Eleniko, the former airport of Athens, may soon make these suburbs unrecognizable to its own residents. How will Athens change in the upcoming years? Is this rapid transformation for the better or for the worse? Will it become another mere investment vehicle for the rich who want to park their money in this up-and-coming city? Or will the city flourish as it continues to receive international attention? For the past four years, David and Joanna have been fans of my long strolls in New York City that I've live-streamed to YouTube. They are originally from England, but they have adopted Greece as their home since 2014. David is a native Englishman, and Joanna has family from Greece. And they invited us on a tour through Vula, a suburb that is about 40 minute drive away from the city center of Athens. Compared to the city center. Yeah. Yeah, more kind of bougie. Yeah, it is, it is. It is. Bougie would be the American word. I'm not sure what they would say in Greek. Yeah, but, it's, yeah. it's got a lot plus snobbery about it, right. but you'll see the women, how they dress, the, the guys, their style. You know, you might pay an extra dollar for the beer. Mm. Um, he built, he spent six million in foundations alone. How did you find out the... Gossip. 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 even end up getting to Vula. We had a house here as well and we um, basically spent a lot of summers here between here and the islands and um, so this was the place where when we came back together is where I felt comfortable because it's you know what I know so we, we came back to Vula. Yeah, for me it's home whether I'm here or the UK it's it both feel like home so I don't feel like I'm living in a foreign country. A bit different for, for David because he doesn't speak Greek so. Um, but you know Joe's my translator so it's great. However, Vula, Glafada, Vuligmeni was always the untouchable areas financially. It's a bit like the Knightsbridge of London, parts of New York, which are almost untouchable. So when we came over here more on a semi-permanent basis in 2014, 
you couldn't afford to live in this area. Okay, so we, we live down the coast in Barkas. Summer destination for Greece. So we based ourselves down there for a number of years. And then in 2014 is when we permanently more or less came across from the UK because the property market had tumbled to the point where everything was half price. So we were able to get into Vula and the old house that we purchased, which was a 1950s house, mm. semi-detached from a, a polycatechia, an apartment building. We saw value in that. Most people would want to knock it over, build a new build. We love old buildings because we're British. So we restored it and we were going to sell it, but we decided to live in it because we loved it so much. Mm. And that's how we ended up being in a beautiful spot of Vula which would normally ordinarily have been untouchable to us. And then we had the horrible thing called Brexit. In 2016, there was a vote by the people of Britain to leave Europe. You're probably fully aware of all that. Jo was able to get her Greek passport because of her, her father. Oh, it wasn't. To the point where I had to get what's called a biometric card, which gives me uh, a 10 year residency uh, because we were residents here, paying taxes, etc. So I've got a residency card, but it, so it entitles me to be in Greece as long as I want, but not in the rest of Europe. Yeah. How will you describe life in Woola? Because Athens is right there. It's a different pace of it's, life. It's like a different, it's like a different world, you know. As soon as you, you hit Voulegmenis on the main road, it kind of opens up and you, you don't have that sort of claustrophobia of the city. I love the city, you know, I love going into the city, but we don't actually go enough. But look, the good thing is, Glafala is self-sufficient. You don't need to be in Athens with what facilities you have in Glafala. So whether you want to shop, eat, drink, it's almost like a little satellite city in itself. You know, Vula is very much a, a family orientated area. Yeah. Uh, you go into the Vula Platea, which is the main square of Vula just up here, yeah. any sort of night, Thursday through Sunday in the summer, and it's like being in a school playground. Mum, mm. dad, four or five kids, Bicycles, balloons, dodging, you've got to dodge kicking the balls. footballs and everything when you're uh, but, walking down the. Uh, yeah, but that, that's a good thing about yeah. Greece as well. Everything's outdoors. Children play in playgrounds at 11 o'clock and at midnight. Yeah. Whereas in the UK, everyone's indoors at six o'clock. That's the one big positive about Greece. It's the it's the family orientation. That's how I remember my childhood being in Greece. Is like just being out at night, you know, just playing on the streets and the parks. I did it again as well in England, but it's it, not so much, you know. No, it's like you say, it's the pub culture and the weather doesn't help as well, but Greece is very similar to Italy in regards to the Mediterranean side of things, where it's family orientation, interaction with people, whereas the technological age has taken that away from our Western cultures of the America, the United Kingdom and Australia, whereas here they, they still pride themselves on face-to-face. And it's, and it's great. I think it's great. David and Joanna make an excellent point. Each city has its own unique culture. In my home of New York, it's all about the hustle. You have to make money, build businesses, and create a name for yourself. Otherwise, you'll be left in the dust. It's similar in London. But here in Athens, daily life goes at a slower pace. There's more time for family and friends. One's personal life is at a higher priority than one's work life. But does this cause stagnation on the city-wide level? Will Athens get blindsided by the greater economic forces that are changing Europe as a whole? 1984. Heavy industry leaves the city center for good with the closure of the Athens Gas Works after 120 years in service. How do you salvage an abandoned industrial neighborhood and make it livable? Do you bulldoze these entire industrial buildings and start anew? Or do you preserve them? By the 1990s, plans to transform this post-industrial neighborhood by the name of Ghazi were underway. Ghazi was beginning to take shape as a premier location for developments in Athens. At first, this neighborhood became a haven for tourists and young Athenians looking to forge their own legacy upon this city. Rents were affordable, construction was booming, and the exciting energy permeated amongst the former ruins of industry. But that didn't last for long. The trendiness of the neighborhood led to skyrocketing land values. Ghazi became unaffordable for the artists that originally made it popular. The surrounding neighborhoods of Thysio and Keramikos are undergoing similar transformations. 
However, one thing that any visitor to Athens will notice is that there's graffiti everywhere. Admittedly, as a New Yorker, it's strange to see graffiti tags next to luxury condos. We sat down at Rudu Bar near Ghazi to meet two prominent street artists by the monikers of Tefra 90 and Barbadi. So we're waiting at this bar here in Fisio, and actually I don't even know how these two artists look like because as we combed over their Instagram, uh, we can't see any faces. We tried our very best, so I have no idea who we're meeting. Uh, we're waiting for them right now and uh, crossing fingers, they're, they're real people. <laughs> Let's see who they are. Hey, nice to meet you. Yes, Maria. Maria. Yes, Maria. Yes, Maria. Yes, Maria. Yes, Maria. Ariel. 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 Defra and Barbadi were telling us how it was like growing up during uncertain times in Greece, during periods of financial crisis and political unrest. They ended up going to fine art schools. But the classrooms did not suffice for expressing themselves. So they sought to express themselves in the streets. The city of Athens became their canvas. So how have Athenians received your work in, on the streets? We were tagging on the streets. Yeah. And there was a guy who saw us tagging and he commissioned us to go next morning and paint his store. Oh, that's interesting, okay. Do you like working on commissions or prefer doing your own thing? I think we rarely do commissions for public spaces. Uh, I think I've done it once. Okay. Usually for us, I think the painting in public space had always was infused with all this graffiti philosophy and what it means to be DIY, to be... Uh, not really legal, but not to be controlled by someone. Right. To do whatever you want in the terms you want and with your own moral code. For us, the main thing about street was uh, doing it free. And free it means without having someone over your head, you know? Right. And, and it also it means for free. <laughs> uh, but uh, at the same time, a lot of us have chosen to work for, like, to, to make trying to make this a living, so um, we usually sell paintings um, or we do shows in private spaces uh, when, in order to find a way to make and smith. But um, neither I think this is a, this is a real income. Yeah. Like most of the times we do other jobs rather than that. Uh, from graphic design to like uh, daily things, whatever it takes. Is that the nature of the job or is that specific to Athens? Athens is not a real big market. Do you think the soul of Athens is still here or is it feeding? I mean for us and for Greece in general, the last 10 years were very intense. In 2008, the housing bubble in the United States burst, which sent shock waves through the global economy and the world started entering into a great recession. What started in America last year has now spread to every part of the world. This was especially bad news for Greece. Global spending plummeted and the two highest industries in the country, which were shipping and tourism, were hit the hardest. The problem is that Greece couldn't withstand this blow to its economy, since it was already in a precarious position, financially speaking. Back in 2000, when Greece adopted the euro currency, it was under dubious circumstances. Unemployment rates were up to 25%. There was rampant tax evasion, governmental corruption, and borrowing was out of control. Greece was edging towards bankruptcy, and it could very well take the entire European economy down with it. December 6, 2008. 
A 15-year-old student was fatally shot by two police officers in the Athenian neighborhood of Exarchia. Protests erupted and quickly descended into violence. While these protests were initially about the shooting, it turned into unrest due to the frustrations with rising unemployment and the danger of a national financial collapse. May 5, 2010. An estimated 100,000 people marched through the streets of Athens. Molotov cocktails were thrown into the Mafrin Bank in Stadio Street. A terrible fire broke loose and three were found dead. June 28, 2011. Unions across Greece began a 48-hour strike, effectively shutting down the country. The next day, a violent clash between activists and riot police erupted in Sigdama Square in front of the Greek parliament. The people were angry at the anti-austerity measures that were voted in by the government in order to significantly cut public spending in exchange for a 110 billion euro bailout. In turn, making Greece in debt primarily to France and Germany. The police were accused of acts of brutality and excessive use of tear gas during this tough period. This is not a situation for human beings and for democracy. You can hear. Years later, Greece's economy recovered. Tensions lessened between the populace and the government. And by 2021, the unemployment rate was reduced to 11%. Athens was changing once again, like it did nearly 200 years ago with the arrival of a foreign king taking control of the country. But instead, this time around, it was the arrival of foreign investment. Neighborhoods like Exarchia, Keramikos, Senkukaki were starting to change fast, beyond what the everyday Athenian was able to afford. A really big thing that thrived, and this was also the street culture, was the fact that people had spent a lot of time outside to like protest, like uh, think about what they want in their life because a lot of things that they wanted uh, were changing. And a lot of people, they turned to art and public spaces because it was something against this oppressive feeling of uh, being uh, all the time in a crisis. At the same time, the real estate market was dropping, so everything about the buildings and neighborhoods, and no one really cared about that. That's why it was very friendly for everyone to use the public space however they wanted, from drug dealing to graffiti, I mean, or whatever, it, it, whatever anyone needed. Uh, so this thing really peaked uh, at some point, and, uh, and that's why I think uh, uh, Athens became very famous for the street art and the graffiti scene. Because you could do it anywhere, everywhere, quite easily. There was not a lot of policing. And this purer movement that was created through an inner need of a society to express itself through the streets, now somehow it is, uh, it is dying if it's not dead. And that's because the transformation of the society has already started. Now everyone is stressed that there's a, there's a train coming, we have to jump on that, otherwise we'll be left behind, you know? Isn't it interesting that sometimes we look fondly upon the times of hardship? The chaos of the 2010s was the heyday of street artists looking to enliven a crumbling city with the beautiful colors from their spray cans. But what once felt liberating now feels limiting. Is the artistic spirit of the city withering away with the rise of prosperity? Or is the artistic spirit merely transforming into something more? But at the same time, I think the big problem in Athens with painting and then everything like that was the problem with gentrification. Something that for us was a liberating, a way of communicating, expressing, creating community. 
this worked the opposite way. Like the fact that you were painting in an area made this area interesting for investors. Investors could use graffiti for lowering the price for real estate or later on using street art in their favor. So at some point, whatever you were painting, you wanted to paint an anti-systemic, uh, I don't know, piece or meaning, whatever, yeah. this would always work against you. So after, after some time, even though this was uh, important for us, we, I, I, at least for myself, I said that Maybe it's better not to paint. I mean, if, if this works against my will, uh, then it's better not to paint in a public space until we find or reinvent a language or an aesthetic that it can still continue to work for us, you know? The ultimate irony of cities is that artists make a neighborhood cool and that people with money who want to be cool end up moving in which in turn causes property values to increase and the artists get priced out. This isn't only happening in Ghazi, where we're sitting right now. This is also happening in the dead center of the city, Ammonia Square. It's already happening. It's already done. That for me, the idea of Athens stayed more than six years ago. Like uh, the idea of how we perceived Athens you know, when you say it's your city, it was a city that still wasn't, it wasn't that commercialized and that touristified. We perceived the city differently. Obviously for businessmen and tourists and people that they were working on tourism, the city was not thriving, but for us it was the most humane city ever, um, since ever. Because it was the only time that people could afford to stay and have communities in, in, in the city, in, in the downtown, you know? Is Athens changing? Yes, of course, it's changing. Yeah. I think for the worst. We invest so much in tourism. In the end, Athens, especially the city center, will be only for tourists and no for Greeks. Probably Greeks won't afford to live in the city center. Mm. They won't afford to go out there because everything is uh, made for tourists. In the city center, in the last five years, mm. rented apartments, they're multiplied by 10. Many of those places that you see are Airbnbs. It is an expensive area because it's city center and a lot of tourists and a lot of Airbnbs mm. hoping. Which makes yeah. it tough, I assume. It's very tough. As a local. Who's moving here, aside from Airbnb? Is Other Europeans. Yeah. And uh, because usually we have them from richer, let's say, countries. Yeah. That means, for me as an Athenian, I can't afford rent because they're very expensive. Because not Greek people are buying. Great people are selling ah, to yeah. foreigners. Yeah. Someone prefer to have his apartment as an Airbnb because he will earn more, but he wouldn't put it into rent for me. Or if he put it, he'll put it for an absurd price. May 27th, 1832, Athens would change forever. A Bavarian prince was in essence hired to become the king of Greece, Otto. While Otto was obsessed with ancient Athenian history, he knew the importance of the city, and he wanted to bring back that honor, so Athens became the new capital of Greece. However, the population of Athens was tiny at that time, so they had to expand and rapidly. So he built his new palace right over here, which is now the modern-day parliament building, and he made this grand urban plan using the help of architects from Europe. Ammonia Square became the center of this new grand capital. Today, Ammonia Square is a point of contention amongst Athenians. Back in the 1950s and 60s, it was the center of Athenian life. But now it borders a growing immigrant neighborhood and boasts tall hotels that culminate in the massive rise in tourism. Most Greek people I've met don't tend to hang out here and some outright avoid it. We met with Isaac Sui. He's a political scientist that comes from Spain, but has made Athens his home since 2014. He ventures to the streets of Ammonia, studying how the city is changing. You know, I came here in 2014, but it was already for a few years, like a very long crisis. Right. Till 2015, 
the banking system collapsed. So after 2015, it starts recovering. But 2015 is what like the last experience, catastrophic experience. But you came here probably because you liked something about it. Especially in here, uh, as a political scientist, you don't get bored because every single day there's something going on. Now it's kind of more chill, but in general, uh, you are taking a walk. Yeah. You are a theorist and you think, oh, demonstrations, riots, and strikes, something happened, but it's every single day. Something. It's just that the magnitude is not the same like it used to be. But just taking a walk, you see something going on. If you want to understand more in Greece, you have to think in terms of uh, Greece, a post-colonial country, which uh, is closer to, let's say, Latin America. To give an example, most of Latin American states exist for 100, 200 years, which is similar to Greece. Yeah. You have to think that uh, Greece was part of the Ottoman Empire for four or five centuries, and the Greek institutions are quite different from uh, Western European institutions, because in a colony, the purpose of a colony is to strike wealth. So institutions in any, in any post-colonial country of the world tend to be weak, dysfunctional, because they are designed to strike wealth, not to provide services. So a Greek state is, uh, you want to understand a Greek state, you have to think that Greeks uh, use a lot of Turkish vocabulary, particularly when Greeks bribe, and they do it more often than in Western Europe, they use, uh, for example, Rusfeti. It's a word that comes from Turkish, Rusfet. So you see that there is a lot of corruption, forget ancient democracy. You have to think as a state that is designed to strike wealth, not to provide services. And this leads us into, uh, for example, policies that exist in most of Western countries, like low-income housing does not exist in Greece. So urban planning also is very weak. So when Greece became independent from the Ottoman Empire, uh, 1821, Athens had a population of 4,000 people. Right now, Athens has a population of 4-5 million, the region of Athens. But uh, most of the city grew in the 20th century, and uh, the city grew without any proper control or management. Right. So the issue in here is the city attracted millions of people in the 20th century because the last 100 years ago there was like war with Turkey, civil war, Nazi occupation. So many Greeks left, went to the US, some of them came to the city, and the city wasn't prepared. The state wasn't prepared to handle millions of people moving to the city. And the city got built uh, spontaneously without any proper organization, most of the city. And uh, for a while this worked because Greeks got cheap housing, which the state couldn't provide. And you can build the city very quickly without red tape because the state is absent. Right. But what happens is that the quality of these apartments it's not good, and for a while it worked, but by the time Greece joined the EU, Greece experienced a huge economic boom, mm -hmm. and uh, Greece started becoming middle class. Mm -hmm. So when Greece became middle class, they don't like to live in uh, apartments where the materials are not good, the design is not good. So Greece started living and moving out to the suburbs. Mm -hmm. So most of Greeks live out of the city center and they started selling their apartments to be able to afford a new place in the suburbs. So the real estate prices dropped by the 80s and this part of the city is still the cheaper real estate of the city. By 1990s, for the first time in history, uh, immigrants come to Greece to do jobs that Greeks don't want to do. Let's say until 1980s, yeah. Greeks were immigrants themselves. Okay. They were going to the US, to Australia. By 1980s, Greeks stopped becoming migrants themselves. Mm. They don't leave Greece. And then foreign uh, migrants come to do jobs that Greeks don't want to do. December 1990. Protests erupt in Albania, the last communist stronghold in Eastern Europe. The state controlled the media. It kept its citizens in ignorance about the fall of communism in the surrounding countries. But the news still leaked through and due to increasing public unrest, the state finally caved in and liberalized the country by 1992. That's when the floodgates of Albanian immigration to Greece flung open. And uh, they are looking for a place to stay. Right. 
and this is the cheapest real estate of the city. So this part of Athens attracted uh, most of the immigrants. So in the 90s, this was Balkan immigrants, or East European, and uh, they experienced a lot of racism because Greeks haven't seen a foreigner in their life, let's say, it's the first immigrants they see. But Albanians found out that because they look like Greeks pretty much physically, yeah. they can pass as Greeks. So they started faking it till they make it. Right. So they are like, maybe your waiter says, my name is Georgos, but maybe his name is Georgie. So if you got a good accent, Albanians pass as Greeks, and uh, by faking it till you make it, Albanians started becoming middle class, and started leaving. And now some of them live in the suburbs with Greeks. Then, in the early 2000s, increasing tensions in the Middle East led to an influx of Syrian, Iraqi, Afghani, and Pakistani immigrants. For many of these immigrants, Western Europe was actually their final destination for them to start a new life. Greece was merely a stopping point in the middle. All of this coincided with the anti-austerity measures that the country was going through during the financial crisis. Greece simply couldn't handle the situation adequately. During this period, Ammonia and the surrounding neighborhoods that used to be thriving with Greek life emptied out. Stores and offices closed. Greeks moved elsewhere, and instead the refugees kept pouring in and with little recourse to establish their own places to live, they slept on the streets. So you got lots of abandoned buildings in this part of town. You had lots of uh, people uh, sleeping in the streets. So it's a perfect place for squatting. I wanted to show you now, this building used to be a public school. This part of town, public services are uh, particularly bad. So that most of people living here are not citizens. They are not citizens, they cannot vote. They cannot vote, they don't matter to politicians. With the financial crisis, you have to implement austerity measures to cap public spending. You're gonna choose to implement austerity measures mostly on those who don't vote to minimize the loss of votes. So it's perfect an area where no Greek citizens live or very few to shrink the public spending. So all these public services like the schools, they shut down one once left the Greeks of the neighborhood left. And this particular school became a refugee squad between 2015 and 2019. So between 2015 and 2019, there were hundreds of refugees staying here on their own without any state involvement. And by 2019, got elected the current prime minister. He's uh, conservative and he's more anti-refugee and more anti-squatting. So he sent the police. He arrested all the refugees and uh, you don't have time to pick up your belongings. And there are like refugees trying to get in to pick up belongings they couldn't take. So now it's totally empty. We got these bricks in order to prevent you from re-entering. And the only thing we got left from this period is that this Arabic uh, graffiti. It says the families and the cities they come from. So it says Afrin. So probably the refugees here were coming from northern Syria. And also, we got some things in English, for example, thanks to Patricia Colón. This uh, woman has an NGO in Spain. She was bringing donations, volunteers, and maybe this Marcus, maybe his uh, German volunteer was here. So this uh, volunteer tourism, we could describe it, was a thing back then when uh, Syrian war was on the news. So people from Northern Europe would come here for the summer. Okay. They would uh, stay here in a squad and go to the beach and so on. Walking in ammonia feels like stepping into Athens a hundred years ago. Now I know what King Otto had in mind for Athens. He wanted a city that would rival Paris or Rome. To bring the city of Athens back to the glory of its ancient past. The tall, grand neoclassical buildings built by the best architects that Europe had to offer. Along with the wide boulevards, to facilitate a thriving city life. The idealist of the 19th century had no idea the peaks and pitfalls that this city would go through in the upcoming century. Now, Ammonia is more akin to the crumbling ruins of the Acropolis. Derelict buildings inhabited with squatters, immigrants trying to make a life in a country where they aren't fully accepted and junkies in the dark corners seeking another high. 
Will ammonia return to its glory days? And could the historic architecture be saved? So now I wanted to show you my favorite building. This is the hotel, Hotel uh, San Rival. Very beautiful, wow. So you can see a bit uh, how Athens used to look like 100 years ago. Yeah. All the city was like this. This was bourgeois. So this building, a couple of years ago, was discovered by an Israeli investment group. These Israeli investors found the potential of this part of town. You look at the map, it's a very good location. And it's very, very cheap. It's the cheapest real estate of the city. So these uh, investors think uh, this is ideal for gentrification. They are pioneering in gentrification. Yeah. And in an interview, I read uh, one of the top newspapers. It is the Athenian Soho. So Greeks reading the newspaper, they laugh. I wouldn't come here even if they pay me. But uh, tourists don't know because they look at a map and the location looks great. That's what they say about Soho in New York City. It was known as one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in all of New York, and they called it Hell's Hundred Acres. The story of neighborhoods rising and falling and rising again is a story that is common in cities across the world. But as Isaac mentioned, my home of New York has one of the most famous examples, Soho, a neighborhood in Manhattan that grew in the height of the Gilded Age, where New York City became an industrial powerhouse. Innovations in cast iron allowed industrialists to build bigger and taller for the fraction of the cost of stone construction. But after decades of the bustling industrial activity, Soho fell into ruin. After the 1950s, there were a few sweatshops still lingering in the daytime, but at night, the neighborhood was a wasteland. However, in the 1960s, artists who needed larger spaces for cheap saw the potential of these former industrial lofts, attracting the likes of Andy Warhol and Basquiat. But that's until a massive portion of the neighborhood was set for demolition in order to make way for the Lower Manhattan Expressway. This was a controversial plan because it would condemn the historic cast iron architecture, displacing a thriving artist community and destroy nearby immigrant neighborhoods like Chinatown and Little Italy. Due to public outrage and budget cuts, the plan was officially shelved by 1971. That's when everything really started changing for Soho. Real estate investors saw potential for this neighborhood and its grand architecture. Artist lofts became multi-million dollar apartments. And artist galleries became multi-million dollar retail stores. Nowadays, Soho boasts the largest collection of cast iron architecture in the world, with over 250 buildings. And it's one of the most expensive neighborhoods to live in New York City. This, this is one of the 20 investments in Greece these uh, Israelis did. And uh, next time you come, this is going to be a boutique hotel. So these Israeli investors are one particular group, but Israelis in general are uh, between the top investors uh -huh. in this part of town. And also many middle class Israeli families are uh, coming, not to buy hotels, but maybe to take a studio and make it an Airbnb. So this is part of the golden, golden visa mm. uh, structure. Mm. So golden visa mm -hmm. is, uh, was till now the cheapest way to get uh, an EU residence permit if you are a non-EU citizen. So there are different programs in Europe, mostly in Southern Europe. This had the cheapest. If you invest 250,000 euros in progress in Greece, you have this uh, EU residence permit that could lead into a citizenship eventually. So they are like uh, now increasing it this month to half million euros. So now it's going to be more expensive. Oh, wow. But uh, a lot of people are hiring up this month to buy properties. But the general idea is in Tel Aviv, any lower middle class person can afford uh, 250,000 euros investment because Tel Aviv is very, very expensive. But uh, in general, most of the golden visa investors tend to come from countries where, uh, let's say, Russians, Chinese, places where it's difficult to get a visa to Europe. So this is the easiest way. I even hear that there are Syrians 
that instead of doing all the journey, the dangerous journey from Syria to Europe through smuggling and boats, maybe if you are an uh, upper class Syrian, you buy 250,000 euros properties and you save all the trouble of the dangerous journey. So in general, it's like countries where you want to get out or have a plan B in, because of the political situation. And if you are upper class, so this is the cheapest place, golden visa in Europe. And who's marketing that this neighborhood is going to be a good investment? Because some guests are asking me about real estate opportunities here. So they see that there's a lot of neoclassical buildings, very beautiful, falling apart. But uh, Greek realtors, generally speaking, they don't come here. They don't operate here. I guess because they have these taboos or complexes because they watch TV. Yeah. So Greek realtors are not working that much here. In the greater scheme of history, cities constantly undergo transformations. A few hundred years ago, massive changes in the populace of a city would be called a conquest or colonization. Nowadays, it's called gentrification. But what does gentrification mean? According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the definition is, quote, a process in which a poor area of the city experiences an influx of middle class or wealthy people who renovate and rebuild homes and businesses and which often results in increase in property values and the displacement of earlier, usually poorer residents, end quote. Will ammonia's gentrification kick into overdrive in the next few years and turn it into a glitzy destination like Soho in New York City? Do any of the immigrants that have come here, do they own any of their property or do they usually rent? So, the Albanians are the first wave of immigrants. If someone has citizenship, Greek citizenship would be the Albanians. Mm -hmm. So some Albanians might have properties, but here in this part of town, I believe that most of the people that own properties in this part of town mm -hmm. are, let's say, I would say like 10% of the neighborhood are Greeks. Mm -hmm. Greeks that are very old. And let's say you are 90 years old. And while everybody left, you say, I'm gonna die here. I'm not moving. Mm -hmm. So it's more like very old people. I ask because that's how gentrification is even possible. If people don't own the property, they get displaced much easier. For example, many Chinatowns in London and New York don't get gentrified easily because the Chinese own their property. Uh, Chinatown yeah. in the US, most of Chinatowns are going to be like 100 years old, maybe. Well, about 150 already. Here there is a Chinatown. Okay, okay. It's like maximum 20 years old. Okay, oh wow. So because the immigrants, the first immigrants, like in big amount, big yeah. numbers came in 90s, there is no area which is so established as 150 years old Chinatown. Because all the immigrants are very recent and they are still struggling to become citizens. Yeah. That's why you cannot compare with the US which has a long tradition exactly. of migration. So this, this hotel here used to be a cab office. The most famous Greek poet used to stay here. So it's kind of historical place. Should be historical place for Greeks, but it's here falling apart and so on. Do, do the Greeks even care? Uh, at least in uh, mass media, do they ever talk I about the landmarks so. and the uh, older buildings? Also, there is another place yeah. where uh, Maria Callas used to live and also falling apart. So there are many places in this part of town which uh, maybe were historically relevant and they are like, maybe an Israeli investor comes and buys it. And then this building is completely new. This is gentrified a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago. But I wanted to show you something here, different things from the shade. Five minutes this way. Yeah. There are uh, like 100 people doing crystal meth. So this is, would be one of the places where you, uh, it's more stigmatized. Like yeah. many streets, there is nobody shooting heroin, meth, crack. But in these streets over there, it's where there is a concentration. Next to it, this is one of the 20 investments from the Israeli hotel group. And it used to be the headquarters of the Communist Party of Greece. <laughs> so, all the irony. It's in your room, yeah. all these guys are expecting vintage. This is their niche, mm -hmm. vintage 
boutique hotels. Right. So there is a Marx and Lenin mural from back in the day, like it was abandoned, the communist headquarters, so it's still there. And some guests of mine, when I tell them what's going on with the meth and so on, they change the booking, yes. that they were freaking out because they book a boutique hotel and the five minutes away, they don't know what you mean. Because I've seen a few YouTube videos where people say, don't stay in Ammonia, uh, or this is the neighborhood to avoid, because people who are traveling from America or other parts of Western Europe, they think all big hotels are here in Ammonia, and they stay, and they unfortunately go around that corner. There are uh, areas of Ammonia yeah. that are bordering Syria, Monastir oh, So the okay. gentrification in part happens because very cheap real estate, Okay. It's next to expensive tourist areas. Okay. So this, I'm gonna show you later the Omonia Square. This is in the border of Omonia. So gentrification is now only in the borders. That's why the deeper you get, the, the worse it gets. So there is no gentrification in the street of the crystal mess. Mm. It's just that, uh, it's like you're just getting to surface and the tourists don't know unless they keep going any further. Let's say that uh, Omonia, there are many things going on. Okay. Let's say like Skid Row of Athens. But what does the term Skid Row mean? It's a term often thrown around when you visit cities in the US, especially if they're the grungy areas. The neighborhood Skid Row dates back to the western frontier of the 19th century United States. As the railroad continued expanding westward, neighborhoods would crop up in these towns that had businesses. Some of these businesses were brothels and taverns. These neighborhoods throughout the years became to be considered dangerous, dirty, and places to avoid. Alcoholism was rampant and crime was the norm. There is at least one skid row in many cities across the U.S. But the worst one is the neighborhood that's actually called Skid Row in the middle of Los Angeles. But back to Athens. The undesirables of Athens that used to linger near the universities and touristic areas were eventually pushed into ammonia. Ironically, around the corner of this 15-minute hotel, which is clearly for sex workers and their patrons, there is a boutique hotel for tourists with high disposable income. You check booking.com, yeah. you're going to say, why should I bother paying a few minutes away yeah. this boutique hotel for hipsters? While next street, we got a much cheaper hotel. Whoa. That's how gentrification works. You buy a very cheap hotel, yeah. you make it uh, cool, there is a huge return on investment. Yes. But they are next to each other, the non-cool and the cool hotels. It's just the branding that makes it expensive. This is one of the Israeli investments. Brown is the name of the group. All these hotels I show you are same owner. Also this one, Megas Alexandros. This was bought recently and it's going to become a hotel too, soon. Okay. Because this is the border and the tourists don't know what's going on that deep, there, deep down the, the ammonia, you know. Mm. So this is where most of the gentrification starts, in the border. You see the Dave there? Everything is surrounding the square. Ammonia Square already looks so different from when I first visited in 2015. I remember it felt run down and I didn't want to spend too much time here. But after speaking with Isaac, I wish I could go back in time to see it in its heyday of neon lights, hustle and bustle, and lavish cafes. Perhaps the story of Ammonia Square in Athens is similar to the story of Times Square in New York. From the center of city life in the first half of the 20th century, to the place that many would rather avoid in the 1970s and 80s. And now, a crossroad of tourists coming from all around the world, gawking at the lights and glamour. Will Ammonia Square meet the same fate? 
part of me is excited at the prospect of change. I want to see a bright and shiny Athens. But part of me is also worried that Athens will lose its soul. Like so many cities around the world that have tirelessly strived for cleanliness and safety, but in turn made it unaffordable for most. However, I am ultimately not the one to decide. I am just another foreigner in a long line of foreigners throughout the centuries that have been fascinated with this city. It's up to the Athenians on how their city will transform in the upcoming years. The only question that remains is how will the Athenians move forward? Is Athens a good city for being a professional artist? Yeah, it's a wild situation, but uh, I find it extremely inspiring. Wow, that was quite a story. I'm Ariel, and I really am grateful for everyone tuning in to episode four out of six episodes of the Athens Urbanist. If you want to explore more of Athens and other parts of Greece, you can join on the official Urbanist multi-day tour. Go to tours.urbanist.live to learn more information. And stay tuned for the next episode where we take a deep dive into the beauties of Athenian nightlife and Greek music. Stay curious, my friends.